We're constantly told by billionaire-owned corporate media outlets that we simply have to have faith in the invisible hand and the almighty free market will lift people out of poverty, that things are getting better in the world over time and we simply have to wait. Poverty will go away, hunger will go away, homelessness will go away. But if we look with our own eyes, we can see clearly around us that economic problems are getting worse everywhere that inequality is getting worse. Study after study shows that poverty is actually getting worse around the world, not better. And a devastating new report by the International Humanitarian Organization, Oxfam, shows just how staggering global inequality is and how it is getting worse over time, not better. On January 16th, Oxfam, which is an international humanitarian group that fights against poverty and, and hunger, published a report titled Survival of the Richest, and they summarized it in this press release titled Richest 1% Bag Nearly Twice As Much Wealth As the Rest of the World Put Together Over the Past Two Years. It shows that in 2020 and 2021, the richest 1% of the global population grabbed nearly two-thirds of all new wealth that is worth $42 trillion. That is almost twice as much as the money that the bottom 99% of the world's population earned. Meanwhile, in the past decade, the richest 1% of people, they got around, around half of all new wealth. So clearly, there is something wrong with the system. And this is something that is true for most countries on earth. There are a few exceptions, like maybe China. But for most countries on earth, this is the reality, that this inequality is getting worse and worse and poverty is increasing. I did a report about this over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. I have it linked in the description below, and it includes all of the sources that I cite today in this analysis. Now, I want to look at a report that was recently published by the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, because it, it gives lie to this ridiculous narrative spread by these neoliberal sophists like Steven Pinker and others who claim that things are getting better in the world, just have faith, capitalism inherently will lift people out of poverty. This report from the UNDP published in September 2022 says, Multiple crises halt progress as nine out of 10 countries fall backward in human development. And if you go into the report, it writes that for the first time in the 32 years that the UNDP has been calculating it, the Human Development Index, which measures a nation's health, education, and standard of living, has declined globally for two years in a row. It says, the reversal is nearly universal as over 90% of countries registered a decline in their HDI score in either 2020 or 2021, and more than 40% declined in both years. The UNDP added that while some countries are beginning to get back on their feet, recovery is uneven and partial further widening inequalities in human development, Latin America, the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia have been particularly hard hit. So this is the reality of the global capitalist system with the legacy of colonialism. Those are the regions of the world that were colonized and were not able to end the, the process of neocolonialism and are still dominated by imperial oppression today. So let's take a look at this report from Oxfam that shows how the global capitalist system, the vast majority of countries on the earth on earth are capitalists. They have capitalist economies and governments, and many of them have neoliberal capitalist economies. And that model shows how poverty is getting worse over time and inequality is getting worse over time, not better. And this Oxfam report just spells it out so clearly. So this is survival of the richest, how we must tax the super rich now to fight inequality by Oxfam, published January 16th, 2023. They say, tens of millions of people are facing hunger, 
hundreds of millions more face impossible rises in the cost of basic goods or heating their homes. Poverty has increased for the first time in 25 years. The very richest has be, have become dramatically richer and corporate profits have hit record highs, driving an explosion of inequality. And the report argues that taxing the rich is vital to addressing this unprecedented poly crisis and skyrocketing inequality. It shows how in recent history, taxation of the richest was far higher. That is, taxes today have significantly dropped on the rich. How talk of taxing the rich and making billionaires pay for their fair share is hugely popular among average people and how taxing the rich claws back elite power and reduces not just economic inequality, but racial, gender, and colonial inequalities as well. So if we go down in the report, it notes that Elon Musk, the billionaire oligarch, one of the richest people on earth, he pays a tax rate of just around 3%. And Jeff Bezos, one of the richest human beings on earth, founder of Amazon, he pays a real tax rate of around 1%. That is to say, in the United States, people who work basically at the poverty level pay more taxes than Jeff Bezos, one of the richest people on earth. And in the summary here, Oxfam writes, I'm reading here from the report. Since 2020, the richest 1% have captured almost two thirds of all new wealth, nearly twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the world's population. Billionaire fortunes are increasing by $2.7 billion a day, even as inflation outpaces the wages of at least 1.7 billion workers. That is to say that every single day, billionaires are making are earning $2.7 billion more on average. And yet a huge percentage of the global population, nearly one fifth of workers around the world, their wages are actually declining because inflation is increasing faster than their wages. So their real wages are declining. And this is across the world. Meanwhile, large corporations are making record profits. Oxfam notes that food and energy companies more than doubled their profits in 2022. They paid out $257 billion to wealthy shareholders while well, over 800 million people went to bed hungry. Only four cents in every dollar of tax revenue comes from wealth taxes. That is to say, a lot of tax is based on consumption tax, which disproportionately hits poor and working people, or income tax, which also disproportionately hurts poor and working people, instead of wealth tax, which is what really should be increased on rich people. Half of the world's billionaires live in countries with no inheritance tax on money they give to their children. So you have generations of aristocrats, of oligarchs, of their children who don't work. They just inherit that money. They, they are born rich. A tax of up to 5% on the world's multimillionaires and billionaires could raise $1.7 trillion a year, enough to lift 2 billion people out of poverty and fund a global program to end hunger. Now, obviously that's not enough. This is just a band-aid. This is barely scratching the surface of what can be done, but it's something, at least they're proposing something. Okay, so let's continue here in this report. Now, this report was published on January 16th on, for a reason. That was the beginning, the day that marked the beginning of the World Economic Forum in which the world's capitalist elites flew on their private jets to Davos, Switzerland to talk about how they can extract wealth from poor and working people so capitalists can make more profits. Now, you might hear a bunch of weird right-wing conspiracies about the World Economic Forum and Davos and the Great Reset and all of this. And they say they want to they want to impose socialism and communism, which is absolutely ridiculous because the World Economic Forum represents the interests of the world's richest capitalists of their large corporations. It's the opposite. They want to impose neo-feudalism 
so they can extract more unearned wealth and rent from poor and working people who actually create wealth. Wealth comes from poor working people. And yet we're, you know, we're told by Glenn Beck and Ben Shapiro that the World Economic Forum represents socialism. It's, it's a complete reversal of the actual reality. And Oxfam notes in this article, in this report they published on about how the richest 1% of the world is getting nearly two thirds of wealth. They write that as billionaires, government leaders, and corporate executives jet in to meet atop their mountain in Davos, Switzerland, the world faces a dramatic, dangerous, and destructive set of simultaneous crises. These are having a terrible impact of the, on the majority of people. They note that, that around the world, there is likely to be the largest increase in global inequality and the largest setback in addressing global poverty since World War II. About a third of the global economy is going to be in recession in 2023. And as I mentioned earlier, the UNDP found that human development is decreasing in 90% of the world, in nine out of 10 countries. Oxfam notes that over the last 10 years, the richest 1% of humanity has captured more than half of all new global wealth. And since 2020, this wealth grab by the super rich has accelerated and the richest 1% have captured almost two thirds of all new wealth. And you can see a graph here that shows this extreme inequality around the world. Since 2020, for every dollar of new global wealth gained by someone in the bottom percent, one of the world's billionaires has gained $1.7 million. And you can see the percentage of global wealth held by the, the poorest 10% and 20% and 30% and 40%. It's basically invisible. You can't see because they have basically no global wealth. It, it shows how extremely unequal this global capitalist system is. I mean, it, we live in a world that is more unequal now than it was at the peak of European monarchs, of feudalism. And what we're really seeing is that global capitalism is bringing about a new era of neo-feudalism. Oxfam also points out that during the COVID-19 pandemic, inequality got even worse, noting that in Western countries, a flood of public money pumped into the economy by rich countries, which was necessary to support their populations, also drove up asset prices and wealth at the top. And they kind of portray this as an accident, but no, this was not an accident. I mean, obviously it was important to have programs of social support for people who couldn't work during the, the peak of the COVID pandemic, but that actually understates what the policy was. Clearly it was important to have social support for people who couldn't work during the time of a deadly pandemic. In fact, in the United States, that social support was very low compared to other countries. The, the vast majority of the money spent was not on providing social support for working people. It was providing a bailout for big billionaires, for stockholders, for big corporations. And I talked about this with the economist Michael Hudson at the time, specifically when the U.S. government passed the CARES Act and how it was as he put it, a $6 trillion giveaway to Wall Street. It was a bailout to make sure that the bondholders and the stockholders would keep making money. It was, a, it was a way to encourage asset price inflation so rich people could get richer while average poor and working people were, were getting poorer. So it, it, this, is, this is not a happy accident. This is an intentional outcome of an intentional policy. And the Oxfam report does kind of hint at that. As it continues, it notes that food and energy corporations are seeing record profits and making record payouts to their rich shareholders and billionaire owners. Corporate price profiteering is driving at least 50% of inflation in Australia, the US and Europe in what, in what is a, as much as of a cost of profit crisis as a cost of living crisis. So they acknowledge that a lot of the consumer price index inflation in the West is not driven by rising wages. It's not driven by an increase in demand. It is driven by 
excess profits, corporate gouge, price gouging and, and price profiteering. So this is, again, a, a huge factor in why we see so much inequality. It's, it's not a bug. It's, it's part of the system. And this graph shows the increase in billionaire wealth from the 1980s until today, from the rise of neoliberalism, this neoliberal phase of capitalism in which the state is not allowed to intervene, in which the so-called free market is supposed to control everything, in which billionaire capitalist oligarchs face little to no taxation. And it's not a coincidence that as there has been less and less state regulation of capitalism, there has been this inherent tendency toward concentration of wealth in a, in a few small hands and excluding a few crises like the 2008 crash without exception we see that this is and this is real wealth this is steady dollars this is not because of inflation we see a constant increase in billionaires wealth over the past several decades they're getting richer and richer and especially in the past few years that has been accelerating at this moment of global economic crisis oxfam also points out that this global inequality makes climate change even worse. It, it notes that its new research shows that the richest are key contributors to climate breakdown. A billionaire emits a million times more carbon than the average working person. Billionaires are twice as likely as the average investor to invest in polluting industries like fossil fuels. So again, I want to I want to repeat this fact for emphasis. A billionaire emits one million times more carbon than the average working person. So rich people are largely responsible for climate change. It's once again a product of the capitalist system. The, and, then the, and then Oxfam adds, the very existence of booming billionaires and record profits, while most people face austerity, rising poverty, and a cost of living crisis, is evidence of an economic system that fails to deliver for humanity. That's absolutely true. No one can deny that. Now, that system is called capitalism, and a lot of people refuse to acknowledge that. But we can see very clearly before our eyes what is happening. They, and then Oxfam writes, to break the discredited cycle of never-ending billionaire wealth accumulation, governments need to address all the many ways in which the economy is rigged in their favor, including on labor laws, privatization of public assets, CEO compensation, and much more. And the, of course, those are all very important things. And those are things that I talk a lot about here. The need to renationalize public assets and natural resources, which should belong to the people. Oil, gas, minerals, lithium, even, you know, uh, major infrastructure, uh, you know, communicate telecommunications, the transportation grid, all of that should belong to the people, not billionaire oligarchs. But they also talk about the important need to strengthen labor laws, more unionization, which is more democracy, workers' democracy. So workers have better working conditions, better wages, so they have more say over their own lives. Decreasing CEO compensation. And then, of course, what they call for is significantly increasing taxation. And, of course, that should be done. It's not a panacea. It's not, not enough to only increase taxation, but it's something that does need to be done. And they show here in, the, in these graphs, this is an incredible graph that shows the decline in personal income tax rates for the rich since the 1980s, since the rise of neoliberalism. And again, not just in the in the West, but around the world, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, you can see a significant decline in taxation on rich people. In the 1980s, in most of the world, taxation on the rich and uh, income tax on rich people was over 50% around much of the world. Today, it is around 30% in, in much of the world and continues to decline. And this other graph in the Oxfam report shows that in rich countries, falling rates of tax, including different forms of taxation on the rich, have coincided with a rising share of income going to the top 1%. What does that mean? That, that the fewer taxes on the rich, 
the more inequality there is and the more wealth hoarded by 1% of billionaire capitalist oligarchs. So Oxfam writes, the spectacular rise of wealth and income at the very top has coincided with the collapse in taxes on the richest 1%. While there are differences between countries, the general trend toward lower taxes for the rich has been remarkably similar across all regions of the world. Oxfam notes that top rates of tax on income have become lower and less progressive with the average tax rate on the richest falling from 58% in 1980 to 42% more recently in OECD countries. And across 100 countries, the average rate on rich people is even lower at 31%. Rates of tax on capital gains, which in most countries is the most important source of income for the top 1%, are only 18% on average across more than 100 countries. And that's the most important form of taxation, capital gains. What does that mean? It means that the majority of wealth that rich people have, it's not from income, it's from, it's from assets they own, right? So if they own stocks and bonds and real estate, and then they buy those stocks and bonds and real estate and other assets at a certain price, and then they sell it later on, and then they make more money, that is the capital gain. And there have been, a, there's been, there have been many calls around the world for many years to increase taxes on capital gains because the vast majority of capital gains goes to a small percentage of the population, these billionaire oligarchs, these rich people. So this is a form of progressive taxation that would actually reduce the tax burden on poor and working people and increase the tax burden on rich people. And this is an increasing taxation, not on productive activity. They're not producing things. Instead, they're simply moving money around and investing that money. And a lot of this is financial speculation. And yet, in more than 100 countries, the average taxes on capital gains are just 18%. This is why Elon Musk pays a true tax rate of 3.2%. And Jeff Bezos, who has an estimated wealth of more than $200 billion, pays less than 1% in taxes. Oxfam notes that it doesn't have to be this way. In, in, in fact, under Eisenhower in the 1950s in the United States, the top tax rate was over 90%. In the United States, the top marginal rate of federal income tax was 91% from 1951 until 1963. Top inheritance tax rate stood at 77% until 1975. The corporate tax rate averaged just around 50% during the 1950s and 60s. And this is the so-called golden age of capitalism. No, one, no serious person would claim that the U.S. had a socialist economy in the 1950s and 60s. This is the golden age of Keynesian regulated capitalism. And yet this today is now seen as radical. That is how far to the right the world has shifted in terms of econo economic policy in the neoliberal era. And Oxfam notes that these were the most successful decades of economic development seen. So it shows once again that this neoliberal capitalist system is absolutely unequal. It's absolutely unstable and is leading to more and more crises, like when the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s or the 2008 financial crash, or the, the economic crisis we're all living in in the world right now. And meanwhile, who is benefiting? It is the wealthiest 1% 1 1 of capitalist oligarchs who are meeting right now in the World Economic Forum. Forum and they're not meeting to discuss, you know, harvesting the blood of children and whatever ridiculous conspiracy it is. They're meaning to talk about how they can continue governing this global capitalist system in which rich Billionaire capitalists get richer and poor workers get poorer. It's very simple. And this report from Oxfam spells it out very clearly. Oxfam is not some revolutionary radical socialist organization. It is a humanitarian organization that is dedicated to fighting hunger and poverty. And they recognize that hunger and poverty continue to get worse and worse. 
in this neoliberal era of capitalism. Their solution is increasing taxes on the rich. It's certainly a solution. It's not the solution to everything, but it's something that definitely needs to be considered. And yet the tax rates that even the United States had in the 1950s today would be considered radical and communist. That shows how far to the right economic policy around the world has shifted and economic ideology, which is reinforced in the neoclassical economics, which is a pseudoscience they teach in schools across the world today.